Okay, uh, I don't see any questions on my screens. So let me quickly cover the basic idea. And then next week, we're going to talk about SIMD and GPUs. So the basic idea of decoupled action executor is actually very simple. But before we go into the basic idea, let's talk about the motivation. Motivation was Tomoslo's algorithm is too complex to implement. Basically, this was 1980s before Pentium Pro. Nobody implemented it. And people suggested that we don't want this much complexity in the systems. Actually, VLIW can be positioned in a, in a similar way also, right? Because VLIW clearly has a very different philosophy than out-of-order execution and Tomoslo's algorithm. DAE is, has a very similar philosophy, but it doesn't go all the way into hardware extremely simple. We're going to see that it's going to change the hardware. Basically, the idea is to decouple operand access or memory access versus execution, computation, via two separate instruction streams that communicate through ISA visible queues. That's the basic idea. Basically, you look like at a system, decoupled an access execute system. You have an access processor, an execute processor. Access processor's task is just to get memory data and supply it to the execute processor. Execute processor's task is to give the addresses that it needs to the memory processor. And they basically communicate through these queues. It's beautiful in a sense, because these are two different types of tasks. Memory accesses may be bottleneck by memory, but computation may not be bottleneck. So you keep doing computation here while you're waiting for memory. And it may be the other way around also. Sometimes you may be waiting for long computations, but you may be continuing memory accesses. So this way, without having the full-blown out-of-order execution, uh, you don't need to stall between the access and execute processors. While the memory operation is going, you can do a computation and vice versa. That's the beauty of it. And it was introduced by Jim Smith in these seminal papers, in the seminal paper in ISCA 1982. And its basic principles are applied in computing systems today, but not, not exactly as it was envisioned. First of all, you can see that ISA it needs to change over here. So communication happens through these queues, as you can see, these are FIFO queues. They are ISA visible, instructions visible queues. As a result, the length of the queues determine how much latency you can tolerate on the memory side, as well as on the execute side. So these queues, the good part is these queues can be very scalable. They're not like the tag matching logic reservation stations, right? Reservation stations are hard to scale. Load store queues are hard to scale. Whereas here, queues can be scalable, right? Because it's a FIFO queue. And these are all FIFO queues. There's also a branch queue, which we'll get to because you need to keep these synchronized as well. Uh, but basically, all of these are FIFO queues. OK, so essentially, the basic idea is instead of having a single instruction stream that looks like this, this is a very famous loop, Lowers Livermore loop. Uh, it does some scientific computation. Uh, you basically have two instruction streams, access and execute. And it's essentially doing the same thing. But whenever you need to uh, do memory access, you do it over here. Whenever you need to do operations, executions, and branches, you need to do it over here. And whenever you need to communicate a memory access result to the execute processor, you need to send, you need to put it to access, access to execute queue. You can see these memory accesses go to that queue. And you can see that the execute engine takes from that queue and could, could put the result into ex execute to access queue. So communication happens through these queues. OK, you can take a look at it uh, if you're interested in more detail. So the big advantage is execute stream can run ahead of the access stream and vice versa. If, at, uh, if the access processor is waiting for memory, execute processor can perform useful work. If access processor, for example, hits in the cache and it's not waiting for memory, it supplies the data to the lagging execute processor. Usually, the memory accesses take longer. So usually, execute can perform useful work, independent instructions, while the access processor is waiting, basically. The key idea is queues reduce the number of required registers. So these are not registers. You don't have to have thousands of registers or internal registers, like physical registers and out-of-order engine. You communicate through these FIFO queues. So basically, you have limited out of order execution without the wake up and select complexity and without large physical register files. Of course, everything comes with disadvantages. Now, again, compile is important here. It's, compile was important for VLIW. Compile is important for modern historical ACE. Compile is important for decoupled access and execute. You need to have compiler support to partition the program and manage the queues. This determines the amount of decoupling you can get. And people have developed interesting compilation techniques for this also, not as much as VLIW has done, and not as much as work that's going on in systolic arrays today, actually. Uh, but still, compile is important. And one dis another disadvantage is branch instructions require synchronization between A and E, because you're actually taking a single instruction stream and separating it into two instruction streams. What happens to branches, right? It gets, uh, they get executed in the execute processor, but you need to signal uh, the access processor make, to make sure that the access processor is not on the wrong path forever, right? 
The other disadvantage is multiple instruction streams. Uh, basically, you need to generate two instruction streams or program two instruction streams, which may be cumbersome. But later work showed that you, this can be done with a single one by taking the single instruction stream and stringing it dynamically into multiple processors. And this is an example, basically. This is the Astronautics CS1 processor. What they did was they have a single instruction stream, instruction fetch unit, and they basically separate it dynamically into an access processor, access instruction pipeline, and an execute processor, execute instruction pipeline, basically A versus X over here. Each pipeline is in order. So this is very important. Each pipeline is simple in order. There is no out of order execution inside the pipeline. The out of order execution capability comes from one instruction pipeline uh, doing something, uh, basically being asynchronous with the other instruction pipeline until it needs data from that pipeline, of course, right? And you can see that there are access registers and execute registers. And these are the queues that you need to communicate between the two streams. And you can see that there are multiple instruction streams. There's a copying unit also. You can copy the operation from one pipeline to another pipeline. So there are interesting communication things that they added. Store loads are always problematic as usual. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but if you're really interested, these papers actually provide a very accessible and nice description of the decoupled access and execute paradigm. You can see there's a restart unit also for branch handling, for example. OK, so basically, branch handling is a big problem. So a lot of compilers use loop unrolling uh, to eliminate branches. Uh, basically, loop unrolling replicates the loop body multiple times with an iteration. So you may actually be uh, lear have learned about loop unrolling. I have to say it because it's a very basic compiler technique to get rid of branches as much as possible, because branches always provide problems in terms of uh, in VLIW, decoupled access and execute, as well as systolic array. So you want to get rid of branches as much as possible. And the idea in loop unrolling is to replicate the loop body multiple times within an iteration, as you can see over here. But of course, now you're doing four iterations, four original iterations within one iteration. So you need to uh, make sure uh, you increment the values correctly. And that's going to be a problem, actually. But if you do this now, you don't execute as many branches. You don't execute as many loop control instructions, et cetera. So you reduce the loop maintenance overhead. Induction variable increment or loop condition test goes away or reduces by one fourth, uh, basically by three fourths in this case. Uh, you enlarge the late basic block. Now you have a bigger basic block over here as opposed to a single basic instruction over here about well, single set of instructions. This enables code optimization and scheduling opportunities. And the problem happens usually when iteration count is not a multiple of unroll factor. So in this case, unroll factor is four. You're putting four iterations into a single original iteration. But if n is not a multiple of four, then you'll have problems. You need to extra code to detect this. So you need to have some extra code to handle this. And that increases code size in the end. But loop unrolling is a very simple compiler-based technique to help all of the processors that we discussed today. Decoupled access and execute being an important one. And they talk about loop unrolling a lot, actually, in decoupled access and execute and how it improves the performance of this astronautics ZS1 processor. But it's important for you to think about it uh, going forward, especially if you're interested in topics like compilation and hardware. This is a very basic compilation mechanism. OK, let me give you the impact of decoupled access and execute in real processors, and then we will be done. Basically, the way it's described, it's not exactly employed in existing processors, but in principle, decoupled and access and execute is employed in all processors that I know of. For example, this is the Pentium 4 processor internally. Uh, I'm not going to go through everything over here, clearly, but I'm going to point out this part. After the instructions are renamed uh, and allocated to reorder buffer, for example, and registers, they go through a memory part and an execution part. So you can see that this is the decoupling. You have a memory part of the processor and an execution part of the processor, and they're decoupled from each other such that the memory part is customized for memory operations and execution part is customized for execution operations. Even in an out of order processor like this, this is an out of order execution, super scale execution processor, even that decouples access and execute as you can see, so that you can get specialization across different components. And you also get basically uh, different out of ordering between these different components. They don't, uh, hopefully they don't uh, uh, step on the toes of each other, if you will. Uh, I mean, if you want to look at Pentium 4 simplified, this is actually another way of looking at it. You can see memory and integer decoupling. This is from my paper, uh, a, a simpler view of uh, the decoupled of access and execute in Pentium 4. Uh, you could actually extend the concept to different types of execution, FP execution also, FP and int execution as well. OK, so that brings me to the end of decoupled access and execute. So hopefully, uh, you enjoyed the three major ideas that we discussed, VLIW, systolic arrays, and decoupled access and execute. 
You may think about where they could be useful going into the future as well. Let me see if there are any burning questions. And if there is, uh, once we handle them, we'll be done. OK, wouldn't this DAE be especially useful in combination with VLIW because of the packaging approach? Or is it rather hard to combine the approach? So that's an excellent question. And in my opinion, uh, I, actually, I don't know if there are any processes that combine it. But uh, my, my high level answer is yes. Basically, if you can combine the idea of VLIW, of course, you need to give up on some of the basic VLIW principles to combine them. You can basically have part of your VLIW bundle as memory bundle and part of your VLIW in bundle as execute bundle. And absolutely, you can decouple the execution and execute between different portions of a VLIW instruction and you get rid of this lock stepping. And you also get partial out of order execution benefits in a VLIW engine. So your point is actually excellent. That's the reason why I like covering these topics together because some of the VLIW downsides can be alleviated simply with decoupled access and execute principles applied to VLIW engines. That way you don't complicate the hardware too much. You do need to complicate a little bit. So you do need to depart from the VLIW principles a little bit, but you get significantly higher performance potential. So excellent. Thanks for asking that question. Any other questions? OK, if I don't see any other, uh, then uh, have a nice weekend. Uh, hopefully, uh, I will see you next week when we talk about another fascinating and extremely high impact topic uh, on SIMD processing and cover vector and array processors and talk about GPUs. Until then, uh, take good care, stay safe, and have a good time.